We put our heart into everything we do. We are farmers, bakers, florists, and makers who grow and create with a passion. 1-800-Flowers, share with love. Hi, I'm Jim McCann, founder of 1-800-Flowers. I'm not satisfied when I learn something new unless I share it forward. And so we created this podcast to continue that, to share forward the wonderful people we get to meet and most importantly get to learn from and make our lives richer and better. Together we'll cover the human experience. And for me, the human experience is foundational in the idea of relationships. The topics will be far reaching, but common element you'll see here is it's all about relationships. So I invite you to join us on this journey. Come experience it with us, share your thoughts and ideas, and become part of our community. We'd love to have you. Hi, Shannon. How are you? Hi, Jim. How are you? It's so nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Looks like you're at work. I am, um, and I am in New York today, so uh, it's been a fun, festive morning. Where are you located? I'm normally in New York, but today I'm uh, uh, speaking to you from Florida. I'm on the west oh, coast of Florida in Naples. I love Naples. I'm born oh, and raised in Florida, so yeah. But you were in North Florida, no? Yeah, I grew up, I was born in Sanford, just out of, outside of Orlando. Grew up in Pembroke Pines down in South Florida, if you know Hollywood, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, that sure. area. And now my family is in the Panhandle. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, you know, obviously being a New Yorker, uh, we have a lot of friends on the uh, East Coast, but when we were looking for a place, my wife informed me that some of her best lady friends were, were here in Naples. So we've, <laughs> uh, we we got here just before the pandemic, which was good timing. Oh, could you have great timing. Well, hopefully you've been able to enjoy it a lot the last couple of years. Uh, not a lot, <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, you get a week, a week here and there during the winter, just breaks up the winter. So exactly. Nicely. Exactly. Well, good for you. Well, congratulations to you on your newest book. Thank you're, uh, you. you're getting quite prolific here. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like I was um, visiting a church that I usually go to to launch the books every year. And they said, well, it's springtime. That means Shannon's back with another book. <laughs> so here we are. And, and and thematically, you could be doing this for a long time because you start off with a pretty good foundation in right. lessons from the Bible. huh? Yeah. I mean, there are already these all these amazing, wonderful stories. So I'm just putting them in a format that maybe somebody who wouldn't think of themselves as a Bible scholar would want to pick up the Bible, but um, they're just beautiful, challenging, interesting stories. So, yeah. Uh, th this is a particularly interesting, and it's a subject that, that we've been chatting about some in, in, a, in a, our team at Flowers or at, uh, at Celebrations. Look, we're in the flower business. We're in the flower and gift business. But we really, really see ourselves in the business of helping our community, our customers, mm -hmm. to express themselves and connect to all the important people in their lives. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, that'll be with a gift, and that's where we come in. But we're certainly thinking beyond the gifting experience, especially in the last three years. COVID impacted our lives in so many ways, mm -hmm. and uh, hopefully it's in the, uh, essentially in the rearview mirror. But it caused us to reflect as a group on what it is we really do, and foundationally, it's our determination that we're really in the relationship assistance business. Mm -hmm. The foundation for all of our relationships, as you so eloquently point out in your newest book, Love oh. Stories of the Bible, is, is that relationships are the key to how we feel yeah. about ourselves, how we uh, enjoy life, how, how we measure the meaning of life. Cut our leg and look at the rings <laughs> and see that uh, uh, what, what you know for sure, as is evidenced in your writings and what we're learning every day, uh, it's the breadth and depth of relationships mm -hmm. that really does determine our degree of happiness. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it seems to me that your approach of taking lessons from the Bible, but more importantly, weaving the idea of faith mm -hmm. and how that's essential to all the relationships we have in our life, mm -hmm. it's just really, really interesting. Well, thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I feel like we have this sort of command as people of faith um, to love God, but to love our neighbors as ourselves. And I think we could all do a lot more of that. Uh, and honestly, during COVID, I think we saw a lot of that where people were actually literally looking out for their neighbors or getting groceries, checking on people, really getting into that caretaking and investing mode and, and really checking on each other's lives and connecting. And sometimes, you know, my family would just, everybody from different states would get on a Zoom call with a glass of wine and everybody would just talk, how are you doing? How are you weathering this whole thing? Um, but I think too, it extended beyond that to, you know, whoever we want to consider our neighbor in our community 
And we're at a place where people feel, you know, torn over really, you know, difficult topics. But at the end of the day, um, you know, I think about my husband's a great example. When it snows, he's the first one out there shoveling everybody's um, driveways. He loves to do that for our right. neighbors and for strangers and people who we all may have different viewpoints, but we care about each other. Um, when someone's sick in the neighborhood or, you know, has an emergency, um, we're chasing each other's dogs down the road when they get out of the fence. <laughs> I mean, I think there are just a lot of little ways that we can love on each other and that we can build relationships. And we're called to do that, not really to just pick and choose who we're going to be kind to, but that we're really called to be kind and build relationships with all kinds of different people in our lives. Let's let's pull on that thread a little bit, Shannon, because I was interested when you write about your questioning yourself when you're checking your motivations. Mm -hmm. So when your husband goes out and shovels the walkway for the neighbor next door, you seem to shine a light on that question of our motivation. Yeah. Are, are we, or in this case, your husband, I think his name is Sheldon. Yeah. Is Sheldon doing that because he wants his neighbor to think better of him? Mm -hmm. Or is he doing it out of just a genuine goodness of his heart? I'm confused as to why that matters so much. You know what? I just thought about it with myself. Like he is, I think, totally pure hearted. That was the thing that really attracted me to him when we were dating is that I could see he was very invested in his family and truly looking out for other people and caring about them. He gets excited when it snows. First of all, he gets to use a snowblower and he really does love kind of spreading this good cheer through the neighborhood. It's his, you know, he's yeah, so transparent as men, aren't we? He loves he it. He play so with big toys. Exactly. So with, you know, he gets his snowblower from his brother in Iowa, who has the real kind, like that you drive around because they, they really get the snow. So yeah. he gets his snowblower and he's so excited, like waiting for it to snow because he really does have this kind of heart of service and it makes him so happy. He can play with his toy, but also do something nice for the neighbors. Um, but I think about myself, I felt sort of convicted when I was reading these stories and kind of the, the pure love that we're called to be not self-interested at all, but really to be looking out for the good of other people. And I thought, hmm, I've had mixed motives sometimes where I think I want to make a really good impression. I want this people, you know, these people to think good of me that I'm bringing in fake goods or I'm doing something extra. And when really the purest love, <clears throat> excuse me, is with no motivation other than to serve someone else and especially somebody who can never pay you back. Or you can do something anonymously and feel like, oh my gosh, I know this is going to help someone's life. And they don't even know it's me. I don't get any credit. And I think that's some of the most beautiful stuff that we do. Shannon, we're not far from uh, Valentine's Day. It was just a month or so ago. And one of the things that we at Flowers uh, tried to do is broaden, with, with very transparent motives, by the way, <laughs> we're trying to broaden the definition of love. You know, obviously, Valentine's Day is a time when we think of romantic love. We were, from a, from a relationship analysis point of view, encouraging people to uh, express their emotions, their love emotions, beyond the romantic relationships. <clears throat> There's a customer I always talk about of ours who uh, uh, realized that he hadn't heard from his aunt in a long time. And she lived northwest of Pittsburgh in a kind of remote area. And uh, we had a difficult time finding someone who would get his flower delivery Aww. that he arranged to send to his aunt on Valentine's Day with a note saying that it's been a while, a long while since they'd seen one another. And he just wanted her to know that he always remembered her at Valentine's Day because she would always do a little project with him when he was a kid cutting out hearts and decorating uh, the house. And and I, I think too often we miss those opportunities. We might have that good intention or that good thought to say, oh, I'm going to connect with, I'm going to send a note, I'm going to call, I'm going to send a gift. And too often we forget. So that's, that's our job at Flowers to be very, very convenient to help more of our customers to act on their thoughtfulness. Mm -hmm. But I think Understanding that love is not just the romantic kind exactly. is such an important lesson for us all. And, and of course, through your book, uh, you point that out a, a bunch of different ways. And you even talk about how love is apparent even at a time of grief. Yeah. And I think about those times where we can step up and be with someone and walk them through grief, whether it's a family member, whether it's a friend. And for a lot of people, our friends do feel like family that we can build, you know, love relationships with them. And there are all kinds of these really deep and beautiful committed friendships in the Bible where people step up, um, even when it goes against the grain. I think about, you know, one of the stories we have is people, if they know anything about the Old Testament, they know about King Saul and King David. And King David was the one who, when he was a young guy went and was in this fight with Goliath and took down this big threat to the people. Well, King Saul's son, Jonathan, was David's best friend. Now, Jonathan 
could have, he was considered a prince. He would have been next in line to the throne after Saul, but yet he saw that David was supposed to be the next king, that he'd been chosen by God. And so he really pledged this loyalty to David saying, no matter what, our bond is strong. Our families will always protect each other. We'll take good care of each other. So after Jonathan was gone, had been killed in battle, David then becomes king eventually. And what would happen in those days is you would wipe out all the family members from that previous dynasty because you would want a full claim to the throne yourself. Well, David had this lifelong- it sounds a lot like uh, the Republicans and Democrats. In the <laughs> exactly. People want to clear the playing field. <laughs> but, but what David did in this deep friendship that he and Jonathan had made this covenant, this compact, is he went and actually found members of Jonathan's family that were still alive and said, how can I honor his family and take care of him? And he found out that he had a disabled son that had been hidden because the people who were caretaking for him thought, David's going to want to wipe out everybody from this family. But instead, David was like, no, no, I made this commitment to my best friend, Jonathan, that goes beyond all of the norms of the day. And I'm going to go and take care of this child. He's going to become like my own son. And so we think about friendships that really are strong relationships. I love to send flowers to my friends. And you make it so easy for us to do that, to act on that impulse, to just get on the computer right away when we have that thought and do it. And modern technology makes it so much easier to do that and just say, I'm thinking about you. And, and I think for a lot of people to get a handwritten note or to get flowers is such a special thing because it doesn't happen every day. And some people see it as like a really beautiful, more old fashioned way of reaching out instead of just a text with some emojis to say, um, I'm actually making some effort to tell you that I love you, I care about you, and you're important in my life. You know, uh, adult uh, relationships, friendships, are something we, we're writing about, reading about, talking to people like you about all the time because especially uh, through what we just uh, went through in the last few years, the isolation that came through COVID. And I was smiling, thinking of you uh, gathering with your family on a Zoom with a glass of wine. <laughs> I, it's one of the things I miss, though, as we get back into our more regular routines, is how we were pretty overt about making sure we stayed connected. Yeah. And it's something I wrestle with in my life all the time and, and work hard at. And I wonder how you in your life with the crazy life you live mm -hmm. uh, from a professional point of view, you must have to be quite deliberate mm -hmm. about maintaining, uh, developing and uh, and creating new relationships in your life because you know that they're essential to your mm -hmm. to your health and to your whole of life. How do you how do you as a, a, a very, very busy professional think about investing in and maintaining those relationships. Yeah, you're so right. We know that the experts, the psychologists, they all tell us that those connections are the foundation of us having, um, you know, health, mental, physical, otherwise, to feel like we have a safety net, a community of people that we care about and that will show up in an emergency for us, we would do for them. It's such a beautiful part of life. I think you have to be really intentional about it. So I do try to stop when I think about some, someone, sometimes I know they're going through something. So for me, I think about, I stop and say a prayer for them. That's important yep. to me. And I'll send them a text, like, just so you know, I know you're struggling with X or, you know, got cancer or the kids are going through things. I'm praying for you. I stopped to pray for you today or send them a note. Um, but I think too, scheduling time for people that you care about, whether it's dinner and just sitting down and, you know, having hamburgers and hot dogs, but just getting together. Or if it's hopping on a, a FaceTime call or a Zoom call. Now that we have this technology, my mom's got a new puppy. And so I love it if I can do a FaceTime call with her and she could show me the puppy's new outfit, the puppy's new haircut. So I think it's just carving out that time. And even if you don't have time for a long conversation. She, she to takes the puppy for haircuts? <laughs> the puppy got a special haircut yesterday. So um, just those little things that if you were together in the same city and you would see each other and you would get to play with the dog and meet the dog, you know, I think we can do those things through technology it can be a really good thing. We've seen the downsides of technology, but I think we can really leverage it to stay connected with people. Like you said, I don't want us to lose that real focus on making yeah. sure that we're checking on each other and being together, even if it was virtual. Um, I think we all came to really realize how critical our relationships were during the last couple of years. Find the perfect gift. And wow, the people you love. Wow. Wow. This is amazing. Whether you want to say happy birthday. So cute. Or I love you. I love you too. Thinking of you. Wow. Go to 1-800-Flowers.com. Celebrate the people you love. One of the things I seem to notice in my social life is that my friends who are have a good faith and, uh, and are regular uh, community mm -hmm. church participants, it's a little bit of a framework built in for them to develop and invest in relationships. 
Yeah, I think that we are called to that. I think to look out for each other and to just the wellness of each other, to bear each other's burdens. Um, I was reading a verse. But, but I mean, you have built in a community activity. Oh, yeah, you do. You do. Where, you do. where you're going to brush up against people. And, and oh. that's meaningful, too, because what we learned during COVID was it was even those little micro contacts, yeah. uh, seeing the, the regular barista who right. isn't waiting on you that day, but waves because you know one another. Those little social micro contacts. Mm -hmm which seemed meaningless before COVID, we learned how meaningful yes. they are. Yeah, and I don't know if you felt this way, that's such a good point, um, that when I would see people again, when we started to trickle back to the office and back to normal, I felt like hugging everybody. I felt like saying, you know, when we said goodbye to each other, we thought that it would be a couple weeks or a few days. We had no idea what this would turn into. And then coming back together, some people are worried about health and germs and, and trying to protect each other and take care. But I just had this impulse to really embrace people and tell them how much they meant and how much I missed them. Like you said, those daily interactions, seeing people um, who buzz you in or yep. um, you, where you pick up your sandwich or, you know, even somebody you, you see um, on the street when you're um, coming into work and you pull into the garage, if that's what you do. I mean, just the people that you would see every day. But I felt this need to, to reconnect with them and just tell them. I never really told you how much it meant to, for me to see you every single day. And I want to make sure you know now. Uh, a psychologist we work with, Dr. George Everly from Johns Hopkins. Uh, we're, we're working on uh, some work product with him now. Uh, he wrote a whole piece for us on psychological first aid. But he's all about relationships and for us to understand how important they are mm -hmm. and how we have to work at it. Now, I'm at the other end of the pipe. I'm an old guy visiting Florida. And... Uh, my wife and I talk a lot about the fact that we have to be very deliberate about mm -hmm. developing new relationships. Why? Mm -hmm. We lose friends and family members are every once in a while. Uh, some of them move away to Florida for, for year round and mm -hmm. they're going to be on the East Coast of Florida. So all of a sudden, you know, my, my kids are, have new relationships in the life because of my grandkids. Mm -hmm. So their friends now evolving from their school friends, their early work friends to now friends that they have and know because their kids are doing activities together. Mm -hmm. But at the other end of the pipe, where us old pikers are, <laughs> uh, you have to be deliberate about your network can narrow. Men in the US right now are really struggling to develop and maintain deep relationships. And I think everybody's working hard. I think we're all striving and you spend so much of your life trying to make it to wherever you think that you wanna go. And a lot of that is just a, a, a big commitment to whether it's you're in the midst of raising a bunch of children, if you're you know working on your company and working on your career. And I think some Sometimes we look around like, oh, wow. So to go have this night with the guys where you wind up having a really vulnerable, transparent conversation, you're really vulnerable, underline the word vulnerable. Right. So many people are reluctant to really exactly. open up because they feel vulnerable. Exactly. And that is where you really bond with people, where you can say, I'm struggling with X, or I really want to achieve Y. You've done that. How do I get there? Or um, we're going through something as a family. I mean, I think when we're really vulnerable and transparent, that's the glue that really knits a tighter relationship. And as you said, I mean, to go out with these guys that maybe that wasn't the plan, but you end up there and it ends up being this uh, fantastic evening that you think, let's do this more. Um, because I think we really, at our gut, need to connect with people. And the more vulnerable, vulnerable and transparent we're willing to be, um, I think the richer those relationships are because there's a true bond there of trust and of relying on each other and of finding, like you said, those different threads of love. We can really deeply love our friends just as we do family. Um, and, and new people can come into our lives. Friends of friends are often a good way to expand that network. And so sure. I find that, um, you know, I've got a good group of girlfriends and when they bring someone new around, we already trust them. We know like, hey, if this person vouches for you, um, we know- They come with that good, good housekeeping seal. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think being brave enough to have honest conversations and be vulnerable with people may be for some people uncomfortable in the beginning, but wow, what a beautiful richness comes from those friendships and those conversations. It seems to me that women have an easier time of that. I think that's fair. I mean, for some reason, women walk through this a little bit more easily. Maybe they're um, more open emotionally. Maybe they are having these experiences of, you said, you know, kids and grandkids and, and walking through those chapters and those school events and different things together. And I think, unfortunately, society in some respects has told men, like, you got to be the tough guy. You've always got to keep it together for everybody else. Um, but the fact is, everybody needs somewhere that they can open up and have a relationship 
that is um, very open with communication and with the reality of what you're facing. And so, you know, whether it is a family relationship, whether it's a friendship that comes along, I mean, for us in our life too, we've had young people come along that sometimes end up crashing with us for a while. Maybe it's a niece or a nephew or a friend of a friend. So um, sometimes you're a pseudo parent to someone too, or aunt or uncle or grandparent. We, we have one in our life that she calls us um, her fake mom and dad. So she's had a baby now. So we're now her fake grandparents of her child. So, but we, mm-hmm. we, embrace that as um, one of those relationships we didn't see coming, but it's been so beautiful and a beautiful love relationship for all of us in our lives. Shannon, with the wonderful career you've had, tell me how the idea for uh, this series of books, but more importantly, how the Fox News books idea came about. Mm -hmm. I think it's really clever and I think it's really important and beneficial to your community. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. I mean, Fox came to me, gosh, maybe three or four years ago with the idea for the first book in this series, which was Women of the Bible. And yep. I was fascinated by that. They knew that my faith is a big part of my life. And I said, oh my goodness, this is a great idea. Fox looked around and saw our viewers are really loyal. And there are certain things that they really respond to um, our support of the military, faith issues, um, struggles in life, holidays. And so they thought, why don't we serve our viewers in this way? Um, We can come up with this book idea. It's kind of a gift to them because we know the things they're interested in and they respond to. And so with this series of faith books, this is the third one I've written in this series, we had no idea that it would explode the way that it did and that people would really connect with it. Um, A lot of that happened during COVID. I think people were searching some people if they'd had faith, wanted to come back to it or wanted to look at it for the first time. And so I think they were just really encouraged. When you look at the stories in the Bible, there are all the things that men and women go through today. I mean, struggles with family and finance and infertility and widowhood and um, all of those things, um, natural disasters. Um, So I think that the stories are really relatable. And um, we were probably all of us a little bit more vulnerable during COVID and during that isolation um, to pick up a book and and have time to read in a different way. So Fox News Books was just a fantastic idea. I can't take any credit for it. I'm just really thankful to be one of their authors. Well, I've had occasion to speak with Harris Faulkner and I know Ainsley a little bit. And so I'll ask you what I've chatted with them about, which is, do you find that in your professional life that people are surprised by the fact that you're so forthcoming about your faith and the role it plays in your life? Sometimes. I mean, um, what I hear from people across the board, they'll stop me in the airport or at the grocery store or whatever. They'll say, thank you for talking about these things. It makes it easier for me to live this out and feel like I can have conversations with people about my faith. And it doesn't need to be just a Saturday or Sunday thing for me that it can be seven days a week and and be a part of my life. And so, um, you know, during COVID, we I was doing a midnight show at that time. And a lot of nights it would be extended. They would say we need to fill two or three hours. And so we would do different things. We would have Uh, a doctor or two on and take questions from the audience, we would have people share with us how they were getting through the day, what was helping them. And people started sharing Bible verses. And I thought, well, this is really weird. This is a news show, but people would share, you know, Psalms that were comforting to them. can't have God involved in the news. (laughs) So listen, he's in charge of everything that's happened in any way. So, um, but people would say, this verse comforted me, or I remembered this from my grandmother or my childhood, this Psalm that really calmed my heart. And so people started sharing scripture and, and we thought, okay, this is a, an, an unusual moment in history um, where people are just very open to all kinds of different conversations. We were glad that people seemed very comforted by that and that they wanted to talk about faith. You know, speaking of, of faith and seasonality, you said Saturday and Sunday faith, we're coming up on the holiest of time in the Jewish and, and Christian faiths. Uh, uh, we use it as an excuse here to remind people uh, about Easter and the role it does or could play in, in your life, either Passover or Easter. When we were kids growing up in Queens, New York, there were relatives we only saw at Easter. It was, they were wonderful people, and we really enjoyed having them around. Th- this aunt and uncle had two sons who were 10, 15, maybe 15 years older than me. So I really looked up to them uh, when I was a kid, and, and I assume they didn't even know it. <laughs> but I wrote a letter to them a few years ago. Uh, they had both retired with their families to Florida. And I wrote them a letter saying, you may not know this, but when I think of Easter, I think of you guys. Aww. I think of your mother and father. And I think of how important you were as role models in my life. I'm sorry, I never really got to tell you that. And we've lost touch, but I'm reaching out now because you were very important in my life and I wish you were still a part of it. Well, I got the most wonderful letter back from the wife of one of those cousins. 
and we we since gathered and uh, and connected. And I'm so glad I yeah. thought to do that. And now I encourage other people to do that because even if it's a relationship you haven't uh, haven't been active a part of in a long time, you pass over an Easter is a time to reach out and connect with someone you've lost touch with mm -hmm. because it doesn't take much to rekindle those relationships. Yeah, and I got to think that to your cousins, it was so meaningful for, for you to reach out in that way and tell them what they had meant to you. They may have never known over all of the years. And what a beautiful thing. I'm sure they didn't. You know, I was just that little kid who was hanging around, you know. <laughs> Looking up to them. Um, and yep. I think about there are people in my in my life that come to mind that after this conversation, I think I got to reach out to them, too. And things like Passover and Easter, where you often gather for special meals and celebrations, yes. and getting together. What a perfect time to do that and to remember those family bonds that you had. Um, my father's passed away, but he was so big on family. And when we were little kids, we would go visit um, my grandparents, great grandparents and great aunts and uncles. And um, he wanted to show great respect to them, too, and say, you know, just because they're older and they're not in our lives every day. They are the people who built this family and you're here because of them. And let's go spend time with them and let's have a meal and let's, um, you know, just gather up. And, and I laugh, my brother and I laugh about it now. But when we were kids, we would go visit the older relatives at a little place called Earth really? Street, Florida, which doesn't really exist anymore. But it was this tiny little <laughs> hamlet of a town and they would make us a big, huge lunch after church. And then we would all eat this great, ridiculous meal. And then my great grandmother would pull a cover over it and say, we'll come back for dinner later. So us kids would say, oh my goodness, we've just stuffed ourselves eat this again. <laughs> and we're not going to refrigerate this, but we're going to come back and eat it again. It was just what we did. And it was the old fashioned way that they did things. And, but we have that memory now of being so grateful that we had those dinners with them and those lunches with them. And, um, it, you know, it, it reminds us to stay connected with each other, but the holidays are always such a good time to do that. And you can be creating those memories for somebody else right. now. Exactly right, because we don't think of ourselves that way. We think of the people who came before us and that, you know, all those childhood memories that we have. But yeah, the way that we open our homes and the, the way that we send a note or send flowers or connect with people, um, that is impacting the next generation who will look back and say, ah, I remember when I got that letter from Jim after all those years and it made such a difference. Well, I think you're making a, a big difference in a lot of people's lives and the way you uh, hold the Bible up to the light and look for these love lessons in, in the Bible and sharing 13 of them with us, is gonna spark a lot of conversation. During COVID, I think a lot of book clubs were founded. Mm -hmm. I know my wife is a part of several of them now, and I'm guessing that you, well, I shouldn't have all the pages that I marked in your book, <laughs> but I think uh, I'm, I'm sure to recommend this to one of her book clubs because there's so many good lessons here and it gives us all a chance to get to know you better. And for us, that's a good thing. Well, thank you, Jim. I, yeah, I hope people will be encouraged by it because listen, it includes the beautiful, good relationships. It includes the messy ones too, because none of us have perfect relationships, but there's hope in that because some of the stories in the Bible, uh, they run very roller coaster type paths, um, but there's good in the end. And we can always see that and find that in each other and in our relationships if we, as you said, work at it and invest in it. And it does take that. Shannon, thanks so much for sharing your time with us today. Uh, we'll be watching for you on Sunday morning. You're doing such a good job on that show. It's an important show, and you bring a really nice balance to, uh, to what goes on on Sunday mornings, and it's so important to us and to us as a nation. Thank you, Jim. Bless you. We put our heart into everything we do. We are farmers, bakers, florists, and makers who grow and create with a passion. 1-800-Flowers, share with love. Well, I hope you enjoyed what you heard, and I know I'll be sharing it forward. I hope you get to as well. Let's keep the conversation going. Follow me along on Twitter at Jim1800Flowers and on LinkedIn at Jim McCann. Hope to talk to you soon.